Well, good morning, everyone. Um, you know, sometimes things happen for a reason. <laughs> I, I was fairly uh, jet lagged and I got this call yesterday that our speaker was ill, which is always challenging. <laughs> and actually, someone had sent me some information about Brandon and he had spoken at other literary clubs. So I called him immediately, and he was gracious enough to say yes, and came from Bellingham last night. Oh my God. So, Brandon Burbank is an entrepreneur, mental health speaker, and mental health advocate. He was born and raised in Whatcom County. He has an AA in arts and sciences with business classes. Brandon is the author of the book, Come Back to Success, Relentless Commitment for a Better Tomorrow. That is a really inspiring title. Brandon specializes in doing talks on mental health speaking from a peer-to-peer -peer perspective. And the title of Brandon's speech today is Embracing Your Mental Health. Please join me in welcoming Brandon Perfect. Thank you, Linda. And thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, um, South Lake Union Rotary Club. Um, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm ready to just give you guys as much experiences that are positive as well as memorable for your own benefit so that you can become the best version of yourself and inspire other people around you. Uh, so with that being said, who's Brandon Burbank? I'm gonna go into that a little bit uh, just so that you can understand more about who I am, where I come from, my background, and then hopefully we can dive into some five basic components depending on how much time we have so that we can really learn and um, really engage how how to better develop ourselves and become more successful with mental health challenges so basically I grew up in Whatcom County and I just my childhood was really filled with a lot of positive experiences a lot of positive memories which not every child has and so because of that opportunities I was really able to harness a lot of self-esteem and a lot of direction and perspective in my life to grow and to have that sense of self-confidence to take charge of my life and take uh, really live life without a lot of fear and not without a worry of, of like recognizing that failure is not an option and that, that failure is really a way that I can learn something from myself um, so like you know graduating from three uh, my high school uh, squalicum of 3.5 GPA uh, playing soccer competitively throughout my youth and a lot of other like youth um, projects um, mission trips to LA, things like that. And so what I've learned from that experience is that any child is like, you know, can, it's really important that we f really po generate a positive experience for our youth population so that we can really harness the opportunities for them to grow and to be become the best versions of themselves once they reach adulthood. Um, so that's a really important thing to think about because when I was diagnosed uh, with this condition, mental, mental illness or mental health condition called bipolar disorder, it was something that was really challenging. It was a, something that I really was totally foreign to me and I didn't know how to really interact with it, how to engage, how to manage the condition. In fact, I was literally like not wanting to accept the diagnosis, which a lot of people, whether you know or not, can relate to that. There's many people out there in this world that are struggling and that don't know specifically if they have a diagnosis or not, whether they're willing to accept it or not. And so the really the realities are so vast in terms of our country as well as globally. And so there's a statistic out there uh, that according to the National Institute of Mental Health, over 50 million Americans are living with a mental illness. That's a lot of people. And if you think about our population is over 300 million right now. And so how do I really plan on tackling that? I think it's also through the, not only through my speeches, but then by being able to inspire people to change the conversation about how they have discussions with themselves, as well as with their peers, their family members, the people that they associate within their workplace environment, et cetera. So now with that being said, I'm gonna go through five, hopefully five components, depending on time, that will help give you more perspective on how to really make a comeback to success when faced with mental health challenges. Starting with step one, develop self-awareness. Step two, confide in someone you trust. Step three, take charge of your life. Step four, accept change. 
And step five, be patient for changes to come. Let's go on this journey. <laughs> Starting with step one, develop self-awareness. I started with this one because it's probably one of the most important out of all five components. Because when you have self-awareness, it gives you the tool for guiding you in your journey of life. Not, it's not every day that you have somebody that can tell you what to do. And therefore, it's going to be, it's required of success for yourself to ask yourself these, these vital questions, especially when you're in a crisis, and how to navigate through that, and how to make the proper decisions accordingly when things are disastrous when things are all over the place and so there's been many times where I've been hospitalized and gone through you know mental health challenges uh, the halfway house and self-help mental health treatment program just to name a few these were very tr uh, testing experiences you know you could even say traumatizing at, at, at times because it really challenged me to think outside of what I was totally raised in to be, then being thrown into an environment at a young age of 19 and 20 years old into different environments that is you know related to the mental health system which is very broken in this world to name the perspective and how we can focus on that is by being really supportive and empathetic so I'm asking you right now to open your eyes to open your ears and hearing somebody's from their voice and their perspective so that you can really think about your life and the challenges that you've gone through whether it be mental health or not and hopefully something will really catch on with you for developing self-awareness now that my I'm a success story so I definitely speak highly of confidence and a lot of positive positivity and I can tell you right now that even though I've gone through a lot of challenges as I might, might have mentioned already it, it shows you that there's hope that people can change. People can still grow and find compassion for themselves and belief in themselves, asking themselves these hard questions that's gonna help them change their circumstances for life. Now, obviously, it's gonna be like this. Success is like this, not just like this. That's what I've had to learn through, through the years of, of my development. Uh, so, a couple of other ideas around developing self-awareness. Trusting your gut instincts. That's such a powerful thing to do because when you trust your gut instincts, you're allowing yourself to, trusting in yourself to making the right decisions when you need to do that the most. <laughs> I mean, there's been so many examples when, like I was homeless at the time, uh, like literally about a year ago, and I had the decision to make when I had to either go into the hospital or continue being homeless. And I asked myself this question, I was like, do I want to be homeless or do I want to get better? And even though I was, you know, totally like I've, I've already had a long, a lot of like life experience, God and, and I feel like my calling was leading me to the hospital, even though I didn't want to be there. But I had to really suck it up and ask myself, is this beneficial for me? I want to continue living. I want to continue to grow. So that's, so that's an example right now to think about finding discernment in your life or in your peers' life and asking them these hard questions that challenges their perspective of themselves and even with you, within your own growth and your own decisions that you're making to find direction and success in building opportunities for your life. So that's step one, develop self-awareness. Step two. Confide in someone you trust. This is something that I struggled with for a long time in, in my like early young early adulthood, early adulthood, yes. Because I was diagnosed obviously at the age of 19. Um, this was after I was post studying a broad trip to Barcelona, Spain, which was a wonderful experience. To give you some more context about my youth, I challenged myself in my youth. I, I was that one kid where, like, I'm not bragging, but I'm being honest. Like, I was that one kid that was actually working a job, um, you know, playing on UC in youth sports and saved up uh, like $4,500 for his first car. Um, and it's like, where other kids were doing AP classes, things like that, but I was like doing running star and just doing things my own way and doing, starting to develop my own sense of self, which is so vital for anybody that is working on themselves in a recovery or just trying to build an opportunity to be happy for themselves. Too many people in this world are so focused on in the rat race of life versus finding your own lane, which I'll get into later on. But confiding in someone you trust, 
This is an important theme um, out of the five steps because I, I talk about it uh, deeply from my experience of studying abroad and then I was working with a therapist and because I was not willing to have this direct and open and honest conversation with her and with about myself, it really limited my ability to grow. It limited my ability to open up my eyes and ears and seeing what I could hear from her, from her lens because she was trying to help me. And that's the problem with so many people in that, with mental illness and mental health challenges. They don't want to hear it. They, they just want to sweep it under the, under the rug. The harder, the harder, but the more honest and the more successful way of approaching it is, is, is facing it head on. So that's what I'm really encouraging you all to, to consider thinking about in your recovery process or just in your journeys as well. Um, that's something that really helped me develop more compassion to learn from other people's perspectives and trying to use these more rather than this. <laughs> um, okay, so taking charge of your life is step three. To give you some more context, um, I've grown immensely since I was diagnosed with this condition, but also throughout my life. Um, there's been so many challenges, but then I, I consider them as opportunities nowadays because as I reflect on my journey, all these trials and tribulations where a lot of people would have given up on themselves, I ask myself, you know, my faith in God obviously was helpful for me, but, all the, uh, but then also my, my higher power calling, but then my purpose, which is like to serve the mental health community, is what has helped me immensely. And so that's my encouragement for you to take charge of your life in, in your own way that's going to help you seek what you're looking for and being honest with yourself about what's what is it that you really want in life? Is it, is it the money? Is it the success? Is it the balance you know I had a uh, one of the past presidents of the Maple Valley Club asked me the other uh, one of the talks he's like what's what do you define as success and I said balance and freedom of life and that's something that I think is so valuable for a lot of us and and I've been able to successfully do that by taking charge of my life and recognizing that I have all these ambitious goals but also I value what I have now because I'm living in Bellingham and that's a humble place to live in, but there's so many more opportunities that I'm aware of and I know that through our ability to live life, every single day is a new day. When you wake up out of bed, it's like, okay, what am I gonna do now to change myself? And then, and then in turn, it's gonna inspire the people around me. It's inspiring my community. So now to give you some more context, with um, taking charge of your life. A specific example that I basically lived experience was back in when I was 23 or 22. 20, 22 I was in, in a hospitalization. And this was really a, a very difficult experience as well because it was really long. But when I got out of it, I understood that because I've had experiences since I was 19 of being in it, that the recovery is possible. So little by little, I got back to work. I started working again at Fred Meyer. <laughs> and, and then as like one thing after the next continued to progress, I got like working on fitness. I was working on asking myself big questions like, what do you want to do with your life? And, and obviously I was starting to catch on to the idea of being able to be an inspiration and hope for mental health. Take charge of your life. Because of that experience, I asked myself the hard questions like, where do you want to live? I told myself I want to move to Southern California. And, but before I did that, I ended up moving to Seattle. So I ended up living in Seattle here for 10 months. And that was a journey in itself. Because, you know, Bellingham is different than Seattle. Seattle is different than Southern California, LA. And, but from those experiences, I've learned something. Because there's challenges. I, I wanted to give up at times when I was living in Seattle and just go back home with my parents or just not be in the best position to, to find success. But the, because of the fact that I stuck with it and I was able to recognize that it's temporary, well, I mean, it's continued to like, it's continued to show and is through my actions, but then also my experiences because I've learned so much from the journey of, of learning how to keep going when you want to quit. 
And so, I mean, don't get me wrong though, I've, I've got a lot of things that I've, I'm still constantly working on and really like, you know, I, I have an AA degree and I'm, I don't know if I'm a bachelor's degree is in line for me or not, but that's just an example that like, an avenue to think about, to consider, to find hope and, and uh, really direction that's gonna give me more of pur purpose to inspire other people. Um, now, with taking charge of your life, there's a lot of things to think about when you do that because you just ask yourself, like, what's making you happy and what's giving you that ability to finding your own lane? I want to talk about that for a moment. When you find your own lane, it's like you're giving yourself the ability to say, asking yourself hard questions and that are helping you being selfish as well. It's good to be selfish because it's your life. So if you're gonna have other people tell you what to do for the rest of your life, I can guarantee you, you're not gonna be as happy as you could be if you're living an independent and free life. So therefore, taking charge of your life and asking yourself whether you have, whether you need an extra help, you know, whether you see like a medical doctor or a seeing a counselor, don't consider that as a crutch. In my opinion, I would say that just view it as an opportunity to learn and, a, and an opportunity to manage something that is something that's prevalent in your life and that has an impact because you matter. So step four, accept change. Okay, so step, um, accepting change is very hard. Accepting change is part of life though. The world is constantly moving around and, and, and like developing itself and growing and finding ways to really like change. So if you're not really really going with the going with the flow of life and finding innovative ways to change yourself and, and accepting the realities of what change consists of, then you could be really in, in some you know trouble. Because too many people in this world, I think, are, are I'm, I'm not trying to get too preachy now. So I would say just from my own experience, I'm going to go back to another component of my experience. An example where I had to tangibly accept change like that. Uh, so that was back in 2017. I was in a hospital a situation as well. And after that, I was sent to living in a halfway house. And that was very very traumatic experience, very testing and, and um, difficult to really swallow <laughs> and asking myself like, I can laugh about it now, but it's like even back then, I was like, you know, crying myself to sleep sometimes because of the fact that it was so like, I felt like I was abandoned. And like, I'm picture a tw young 20 year old just trying to figure his life out and feeling like he's trying to forge his own lane, but it was like I was going the wrong path. And luckily, because of my persistence, I was able to you know, get out of that um, hole and find better light and better opportunities to change. But I'm talking about accepting change because of the fact that in this experience, in this very moment, I could have broken down and just gave up and just, you know, said whatever. I'm not going to like take charge of my life. I'm not going to take responsibility of my actions, have accountability for myself. But instead, I asked myself these hard questions that really helped me persevere and, and find persistence, which is some of my God-given gifts thankful to have because of the fact that I've managed through so many unforeseen circumstances and somehow been able to remain stable and manage my, my condition and manage my, my, my balance of life. So asking yourself that question right now, what's going to help you accept change and giving yourself that ability to allow it to come organically, let it come when it, when it comes, but it's going to take effort as well. It's going to take a lot of an understanding of knowing where you're going, knowing what your path is. And for, so for example, think about it from this way. Having long-term goals is great, so is having short-term goals. Since if you know where you're going five, 10 years down the road, ask yourself constantly on a daily basis, am I, am I doing this, is it what I'm doing right now beneficial for where I'm trying to be at in the next five years? And if it's not, then consider this, maybe do something different or ask somebody else who you can confide with, whether it be a friend or a mentor or a business coach, whatever that might be um, in your alley that helps you find success and find your own lane. 
I can't stress that enough because if we are always just trying to, you know, keep up with the Joneses and trying to find the, like, learn how to, like, it's okay to be different is what I'm trying to say. Like, it's okay to embrace your, your inner goals and your inner challenges and accepting your inner flaws, the things that have made you who you are. So that's step four, accept change. Uh, wrapping up with step five, be patient for changes to come. Uh, think about it from this point of view. Being patient, obviously, is a, a huge quality trait that can help all of us. Because a lot of us want to be rich. A lot of us want to be really successful. While a lot of us want to you know, make it, make it in, that, in our career paths or whatever that might be. But through the years, that was me, like in my 20s and things like that. And I've had to learn how to embrace and recognize that through these opportunities, it's, it's taken time and it's taken, it's gonna take a lot longer than I was anticipating to be a, uh, a keynote speaker and a professional mental health speaker. To give you some more context, two years ago, I started my uh, speaking career uh, in Southern California in Long Beach. And I was doing a talk for, at Thunder Studios where I used to work for, and they gave me the connection, gave me an opportunity to uh, rent the stage. Three people showed up. And so after I know, I knew, I told myself, well, this is going to be a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> and but because I had the strong purpose and the strong like desire to to be in this own field, this career path, it hasn't, it it, it made it easier. It's definitely still hard, but it's made it easier to get to this point of success, get to this point of where I can say I'm, I'm smooth sailing, on in my own lane, to building opportunities. Okay, so that's step five. Now, just in wrapping up this conversation, I hope that some of the takeaways, um, we're gonna repeat them real quick, starting with step one. Develop self-awareness. Step two, confide in someone you trust. Step three, take charge of your life. Step four, accept change. And step five, be patient for changes to come. And ask yourself this last question. What is it that you need to do right now to take action for your life and build that momentum up so you can find your success in your own life. Thank you, God bless. Um, so we can open up now for Q&A. Yes? How do you feel about the like, hospitalization and the fact, like, was it helpful? Like, do you, like, what changes do you need to, like, do you feel like you need, like, that needs to happen in, like, the medical, like, healthcare for mental, like, awareness and mental health? Oh, yeah. Um, well, as you can see, I have this mental health pin here. So that represents mental health. But to answer your question, I would say there's a lot of stigma around mental health. And that's the biggest word that comes to mind because when we're more receptive to different opinions from different like angles about mental health and changing the conversation about mental health, we can grow from other people's opinions because we can learn from them and ask ourselves like empathetically by putting ourselves in their in their own shoes of the other person that you're that they might that you might know or that um, that you might communi be communicating with that's struggling with their mental health in the moment, and so that connection with the hospitals and everything. It, that the hospitals is one of the most important places for people to get the treatment that they need. Um, and so that's another reason why, you know, I'm not going to go political here, but it's just the funding is, is something that could really help a lot of, um, of, of people to get opportunities. But the last thing I'll say is that I'm not the type of person that wants to, people to have handouts because I think that people should earn what they're, you know, their God-given talents and their opportunities to inspire an impact. And so that, that kind of comes with the balance. Do you think there's like organizations out there that were especially helpful to you, or was it mostly just like you work, work in the hospital or the other like nonprofit organizations? Or yeah, something? definitely nonprofit organizations that have the equipment and the skill set, the staffing to help with mental health challenges and serving the community. Um, you know, you see it around in Seattle, Bellingham, around the country, around the world. Um, but that, yeah. Do you have any human name? Um, NAMI. NAMI? NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Illness. Yeah. 
and um, DBSA, Depression Bipolar Something Alliance. Yes. Okay. Right. How, do you, how do you think uh, we as a society should respond? We often, I, every week I see someone who's clearly having an episode wandering around in the streets and completely disconnected from reality. What do you think we should do as a society? How should we help them? these people? I mean, yeah, that's a good question. I would say it starts by, well, specifically with that individual that you're talking about, they have to be able to want the help. And if they're, at, if they're willing to ask for the help, that makes a huge difference. But if it's like, if they're not willing to ask for help, it's really out of your control. And so then it also starts with where, you know, that's, that, I think that's my biggest answer because if, if the person, you can't just be holding their hand all the time and just telling them, hey, do this, do this. But it's like if you're, also if you're having positive experiences to like interact with the community and really like to like engage and actually asking people like by listening attentively, that's the, that's the way where you can really get to know somebody and understanding their story. And then, and then they are more inclined to open up. Yeah. What role did social media play in your earlier problems and how you live your life now? How much of a factor is that? Uh, social media hasn't had a huge impact on my journey. Like, I, I think that you know, living a balanced lifestyle is important, and by being able to like just. I think have that balance and knowing like, yeah, as far as like when to stop watching social media or just when to do social media. And it's just definitely changing because there's a lot of educational opportunities nowadays as well. I'm, I'm curious about the process you went through to write your book. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, uh, so about, I started writing it when I was living in Seattle, uh, which was about three years ago. And I was working at Volvo Car Seattle at the time, and then the pandemic hit. And then I moved over to QFC, another position in University Village. And through this journey, I started to learn how to be disciplined and motivated to my community which is you know, to, to write this book, and got in some inspiration from uh, a f adjunct faculty member at Western in Bellingham who said, you should write a book. And so I ended up, you know, took charge of that idea and, and made it my own. So, um, and then it was published um, in 2021 on Amazon. Do you have any suggestions for, there is a person I know who I and some of her family members are, are pretty sure that she has some mental health condition, probably bipolar. She is absolutely certain she doesn't and wants to hear nothing about it. Got any suggestions? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because that used to be me. Okay. And I, I remember no, no. Uh, I had a friend that I, I, when I lived in Southern California and I had this conversation about like bipolar disorder and I was just like, it's called um, radical acceptance. I'm not gonna just continue living life and not being healthy and a happy person when, and not acknowledge something that is, you know, that I have to be able to manage. Whether, but it, the, the, the freedom that I have is that I can choose how I wanna manage it. Whether I wanna, you know, do medications or therapists, things like that. And if the person that you're, you know, interacting with, um, this is just my opinion now, is you know, is not asking for help and not willing to to change their life, then it, that's on them. So, and it's sad, which is a lot of people. So that's why, by more people sharing their story, like myself, it, it really sheds light on the perspective. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say that my niece has bipolar, and what I've understood now finally is the highs and the lows are so low, <laughs> but she manages with medications and physical therapy and discipline, and you know she sees it as managing a disease, 
or you know, commission. Um, but it is so hard. I really commend you for all the work you've done on yourself, and then sharing that with others. I think is so valuable. Thank you. This may seem an off the wall question, but it's a serious one. Uh, I love a child who is uh, ADHD. And after years of working on this issue, one of the things that happened was that he realized there are some advantages to it. Yes. <laughs> really. He thinks faster, he moves faster, he has a different way of approaching life. <laughs> is there an advantage of course yeah. to being bipolar? Of course. I think um, really there's this perspective, uh, his name's Napoleon Hill, and he had a son in the like, early 1900s who was deaf. Mm -hmm. And he instilled in his son faith and desire to, to be able to hear. And so they did like treatments with doctors, and through time and development of innovation, uh, there came an opportunity to get like a testing for this ear thing and so his son after graduating from college and things like that was able to take on that opportunity and now he's he was selling those globally and nationally to other deaf people so my for that I, that's another example but then for my example obviously I've shared my story I think by more people asking themselves what do they have to offer and what do they have what gifts can they provide to other people that's going to help really like inspire other people to change yes um, what about like family how um, if you like you know you have a sibling or you know a child or a parent or whatever like what what do you think is someone's like what do you think they can do for that other person or do you just kind of feel like okay that's that person's life that's their story in what context or in what terms Men mental illness or you know again not really knowing what they have they don't want to get treatment they don't want to make a decision they kind of just you know you know disappeared off into the whatever <laughs> off over there <laughs> Um, so if I'm understanding you correctly... I, I can be more honest. My, my youngest brother, um, you know, we lost contact with him years ago. Uh, like at the age of like 20, um, just disappeared, homeless, living in LA somewhere, just disappeared. And we, we had a high personal detective to go get him, and he just kept, you know, brushing us off, like wouldn't talk to us. But um. there's definitely mental health issues there, because he ended up doing drugs and stuff like that. And just you know, ended up in a mental hospital and stuff like that. Oh. But you can't, you can't interact with them. There's no interaction. Okay. How do you offer support, I should say, or do you not? Well, when it's family, that's hard because it's like, yeah, the. You can speak from a personal. I'm like, I'm just. Personally, I yeah. think that. Yeah, I think it goes back to like if the if your brother is not willing to like ask for help, there's nothing you can do because he's an adult. Yeah. And it's up to like with my family, there's been a lot of challenges and f for sure. But because I'm willing to put an effort sometimes, <laughs> even when I don't want to, <laughs> that's that's part of life. And so, but I've sacrificed because I want to have a relationship like with my family and the, vice versa. And so that's kind of, that's really the best um, uh, perspective I can so give. So you, like, you, you can, I mean, I'm sure, when, you know, we wait and one day, you, you know, you figure, you hope he figures it out because he's in his like early 20s now, so. Yeah, but he lives with his mom, so he finally went home to his mom, but yeah. Maybe write him a letter. Oh, I like that. That's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Can I ask one last? Oh, did you uh, we have, what time is it? I, just did, I was going to say that, Brandon, you have a very inspiring story yourself, and I was just wondering what you're, what, you wrote this book. What is the goal? What Do you have a hope for that book as far as uh, what people will take out of it? And, Yes, primarily talking about mental health and hopefully because people love stories. I mean, we're, we're human beings, we love stories and because of we love stories, 
hopefully mine, I think mine's very exciting and very like authentic and original. And so because of that, I think that I can really attract a lot of people to really be more open to wanting to hear like about mental health. And I think by then it'll just like spark other opportunities to, you know, be creative and have more people become more creative in this world. Because I think a lot of things in this world we lack is creativity and imagination. Like when we come, we become adults, like we just get into this like redundant cycle. And like I was watching a TED talk the other day that talks about if you, so many people are in 95% of the time on this needle, but if you ask yourself when you're in the situation how to turn your knob in this needle, in the 5% of positive energy, you can really change the direction of where you grow. My question is, um, so you've written the book, you're starting a career as a public speaker, or maybe have done that now for a while. Yeah. How do you see that as part of the healing experience for you? That's a great question. I think it's, it's a reminder, because I've gone through challenges that I don't want to go through again. And when I think about that and when I like talk to people about it, whether they have a challenge with mental health or not, I, I just think that I, it's part of my calling. Like I found my purpose now. That's so great. I think that'd be a great place to end. Mm -hmm. okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Recording stopped like that. Um, Thank you. Okay.